So, moving to the start of the conference, um, first of all, I would like to invite uh, my colleague, uh, Andrea Zanini, the first speaker. And uh, first of all, I would like to sketch some, to spend some words about, to describe the um, professional profile of uh, Andrea. Um, Andrea is a full professor in modern history at the University of Udine. And um, he did uh, his PhD in social economic history at the University of Bocconi in Milan, and then he worked as lecturer at the University of Padova. His scientific interests concern different historiographical areas, such as uh, the social history of the Republic of Venice, 15th, 19th century, the demographic history of the Alpine area, 16th, 20th century, the environmental history of the Alps and the Veneto region. He is also interested in political issues, especially concerning the history of the Second World War and Italian resistance. He, his most recent book is Storia minima d'Europa dal, Neolit dal Neolitico Oggi. Uh, Andrea Zanini is fellow of different Italian and international scientific associations, such as the Renaissance Society of America and the Society, Società Italiana degli, degli Storici dell'Età Moderna, and component of different projects. He is uh, currently the head of the Department of Humanities and Cultural Heritage of the University of Udine. Andrea, please. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. Uh, the project of reconstructing the economic and legal framework of the European market of books in early modern Europe is an exciting challenge and a great historiographical provocation. Europe in the Renaissance was a magnificent mosaic of histories, cultures, and human experiences. Seen five cent centuries after, the great internal diversity of the continent may probably seem less remarkable than how it appeared to the man from that age. However, the possibility of looking at the past from a point of view unknown to the contemporaries is one of the few benefits of hindsight. What I want to say is that every consideration about the complexity and variety of Europe in the past unavoidably ends with touching the nerve of the present condition of the continent and its apparently not non-negotiable diversities. And this because what we are in the present world depends greatly from what we as community think of ourselves in the past. Even if, as individuals, we are not aware of our history, and therefore every history, as Benedetto Croce said, is contemporary history. These notes yearn to fix some introductory points about the relation between prices, economies, and social groups in pre-modern Europe, such an ambitious goal that I will surely fall short of it. I hope you will forgive me. The history of prices marked deeply the scientific discipline of economic history in the 20th century. After the great impulse that history as a scientific discipline based on objective basis received in the 19th century, at the beginning of the following century, we reached an almost complete knowledge of the general content of the major public archives of the European states. Inside these archives, information about the economy before the Industrial Revolution were often copious, but fragmentary and for the most part useless for quantitative and mathematical approaches. The complex methodologies that the economic science used to measure and analyze the economic facts during the first part of the 20th century were unsuitable to economic historians of pre-industrial times. Among these problems, around the middle of the last century, the history of prices reached the status of academic discipline. When in 1977, 67, 1967, Fernand Brodel and Frank Spooner published their seminal work 
prices in Europe from 1450 to 1750 in the fourth volume of the Cambridge Economic History of Europe, they could already use a good number of case studies based on a shared methodology. One missing case was that of Venice. The great French historian had dedicated many studies to the city that in the that in the age of the Renaissance was still the capital of the Mediterranean-centered world economy. However, one century and a half of researches in the Venetian archive of the Frari had excluded the possibility to discover a reliable series of prices for the age of the Serenissima. Let me pause on this episode, recalling and elaborating on what told me about it Professor Ugo Tucci, who honored me being my PhD tutor. To reconstruct the movement of prices of Venice, together with some younger colleagues, Ruggero Romano, Ugo Tucci, and Frank Spooner, Brodel decided to consider some minor cities surrounding the capital, Bassano del Grappa, for which some good series of prices deriving from the grain supply system, Anona, had already been published in 1963, Chioggia and Udine. The extraordinary interesting series of grain prices, grains prices of Udine became therefore one of the major target of the history of prices in Europe. Unfortunately, for methodological and personal disagreements between the scholars, only one lesser part of the research on the grain market of Udine has been published, even though it has been quoted almost everywhere in the specialized literature. For example, in the essay of the Cambridge Economic History of Europe of Brodel and Spooner. The history of the Udine series of grain prices had been recently edited by the demographer and economic historian Alessio Fornasi. This anecdote can be useful at the beginning of this long project of research. It stresses the value and significance of creativity and initiative in the economic history in a general sense and specifically in the history of prices. Such an apparently arid discipline requires instead great capacity of imagination. Secondly, methodological instances are not abstruse technicalities, good only for hyper-specialized workshops. They are fundamental issues from which may depend the final results of a research. Viewed through the lens of the history of prices, the great tableau of the European economies in early modern times is discouraging. Some general, well-known problems hinder a general comparison. I will try to summarize them in three points. First of all, in the documentary sources, prices are normally expressed in local units of accounts, and quantities are quoted following the local system of weights and measures. For every kind of international comparison is therefore necessary to convert prices in some reliable indicator and quantities to metric units. Prices are normally converted in grams of silver, but silver too was a subject to market fluctuations. At the end, comparing international series of prices looks like walking on quicksand among alligators, only metaphorical alligators, fortunately. A second set of problems stems from the type of or category of goods one chooses to use or has the possibility to use. Grain prices are the most studied series, not only because grains were the basic outcome of all the pre-industrial economies, but because, for the same reason, data referring to grains are easy to find in most of historical archives. Are movements of grain prices proper indicators of the condition of an economy or good proxies of the fluctuations of the standard of living of a population? For these reasons, where possible, a panel of consumer goods has been reconstructed in order to obtain a consumer price index 
as deflator for nominal wages. So doing the purchasing, purchasing power can be compared over time and between places. And as far as I know, books have never been included in one basket of consumer prices. The third series of problems concerns consumers, namely the social composition of the pre-industrial economies. Grains, candles, textiles, wine, masons or laborers wages, that is to say the most exploited topics in the quantitative history of the past, are precious descriptors of the economy of the lower classes, the great bulk of every pre-industrial population. But what about the middle and upper classes that were the engines of the market economy? We know very little about the economic fluctuation, fluctuations of these social strata, despite the fact that the pr private archives of the European affluent families are full of documents about patrimonies or consumptions. It's very difficult to aggregate this data and to organize them coherently. Consequently, they are mostly unusable for comparison. Only a large scale survive, like the one we are starting, can get through this minefield. Since Brodel's time, times, the history of price has made bold advances. A new academic branch has born, the so-called cleometric, that is the application to the study of history of econometric techniques. Many researches have been conducted, cross-checking data from different sources, and some precious results have been reached. While in the first phase, the historians of prices tended to highlight the similarities and the common trends of the prices of foodstuffs and handcraft objects at European level and in the long run, recent researches have overturned this perspective. If at the end of the 15th century, European prices varied within an acceptable range, from the second half of the 16th century, the standard of living diverged progressively and dramatically. While in London, the purchasing power rose gradually between the 17th to the 18th century, in cities like Antwerpen and Amsterdam, real wages were high in the Middle Ages and fell slowly but continuously afterwards. The decline continued until the end of the 19th century, when the effects of the Industrial Revolution finally touched the continent. At the end, a third set of cities, from Milan to Naples, from Krakow to Valencia to Venice, saw their real wages halved between the Renaissance and the mid-18th century. In this context, a great effort to reconstruct and describe the book market in Europe between the 15th and 17th centuries may represent a decisive contribution for the comprehension of the economy of the pre-industrial society. Books were complex items made of sophisticated competences, raw materi materials, intellectual assets, marketing strategies and entrepreneurial energy. I am very curious and even anxious about the outcomes of this project. A different but related problem that is in the background of this set of issues is the question about the causes of the internal economic differences in Europe and how far contemporaries were aware of them. It's well known that the matter was theoretically solved at the middle of the 18th century by the French physiocrat François Quesnay, who finally linked high level of prices to opulence and famine and misery to low salaries and low prices. But the smartest voyagers of pre-modern Europe had already discovered this rule that nowadays we take for granted.
Fine Morrison in the 1590s wrote that there wasn't any better sign of the richness of a state than the high price of essential goods and that the best proof of the poverty was a low level of prices. The English naturalist John Ray, half a century later, reaffirmed that the expensive price of basic goods was the evidence of the wealth of the country. This apparently obvious problem is of great interest for the economic history of the pre-industrial societies because a great uniformity in the level of prices is usually considered as a signal of the existence of an integrated economic area. When different regions exchange continuously goods, services, workforces and money, they tend to develop a unique market. In the classic economic theory, this is a prerequisite for a political and institutional unification. The existence of an integrated European market of books with functional differences of prices from one area to another, but with similar characteristics and the existence of a transnational network for book distribution and sale could reinforce the hypothesis that at the very beginning of early modern times, Europe had reached a considerable degree of integration. Connecting books, normally considered as parts of the history of culture and of history of ideas, with the history of prices, is therefore an intellectual and historiographical challenge. There is another macro transformation on the background of this research, the long debated process of construction of the pre-modern state. The second part of the 16th century and the first part of the following century were moments of great acceleration for state building. It was the so-called Iron Century, a century of high European infighting. They were years of continuous conflicts, like the devastating war of 30 years, use of new military technologies, increasing role of the states in managing the war, as Charles Tilly, Charles Tilly masterly summarized, war made a state and the state made war. The historiography on that age has been recently renewed, focusing on the role of information and the practices of collecting, collecting organizing and mastering information. There is a great interest about the structure and use of archives, the methods of exchanging communication, especially in foreign and war matters, the art of writing and composing, etc. The early modern state from the Renaissance to the absolutistic age was the world of the written world, a letterocracy has been recently named. But the evolution of the European state could not have been without books and without the existence of a complex network of production and markets of printed documents that made possible the exchange of an enormous number of new information and skills. Books were the tools through which unprecedented emerging individuals could become a new, like, specialized, non-noble bureaucracy. Books were a pillar for the construction of the pre-modern state, as much as it was the letter or the musket. In this sense, we might speak of a bibliocracy of the early modern times, a term that I'm sure the many professors of history of books of my department would certainly appreciate. <laughs> I want to conclude these notes recalling one of the most recurring themes in the splendid volume of Angela Nuovo, dedicated to the book trade in the Italian Renaissance, the amphibious profile of bookmen of the Renaissance, who were at the same time humanist publishers, members of the ideal republic of letters and businessmen, 
quote, I quote, driven by the most advanced economic rationality of their age. In our epoch of financial economy and civic irresponsibility of business, going back to the roots of the European capitalism may probably teach something to ourselves. Perhaps in the man who four centuries ago wrote, produced, sold and read books mixing, mixing business and culture, following at the same time the goal of making money and the ab ambition of disseminating knowledge, also prohibit knowledge, we may find a suggestion to escape from the moral crisis of our times. Thank you very much. Thank you, Andrea, for a really uh, fascinating insight of the book history and trade. And uh, I really liked a lot uh, this uh, image uh, of uh, that uh, Europe will, will reach uh, a, a good level of integration, thanks for, of the book markets. It's, uh, for me, it's a really a very, um, very nice uh, image.